There I was, knee deep in a muddy case I just couldn't crack. My leads had gone dry and the ground around me was anything but. Rain pounded my head like it was teasing me, like it was the answers I needed knocking at a door. A door I just couldn't open. Luckily, I wasn't a real detective. I was playing Blade Runner, developed by Westwood Studios, creators of the famed Command & Conquer series, and released in 1997, Blade Runner is an open-ended point-and-click adventure set against the dank, moody backdrop of Ridley Scott's 1982 science fiction film of the same name. Scott's Blade Runner is one of my favorite movies of all time, and indeed one of the most influential science fiction movies ever made, a thought-provoking, trippy, neo-noir mystery that helped popularize the relatively new genre of cyberpunk and whose influence still resides in video games to this day. The world Scott crafts in Blade Runner isn't just chromatically dark, but exhibits a humanity that's societally gorged. Advertisement has become omnipresent, and there's constant reminder that the grass is allegedly greener on planets other than Earth. But it's humanity's latest technological advancement that proves to be its biggest problem. Replicants. Androids made to look human but live in slavery. If and when a replicant escapes, it's a Blade Runner's job to hunt them down and retire them, or to put it plainly, kill them. Blade Runner itself is based on Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, a 1968 novel by renowned author Philip K. Dick, and in line with most of his writing, Electric Sheep is odd and surreal, exploring themes like entropy, abandonment, and the nature of reality. The opening chapter describes a household machine that gives users a variety of sensations, like a vending machine for emotions. Both the book and movie feature Rick Deckard as their main character, a Blade Runner who is driven, at least in the book, by his desire to own a real animal, something that's become a luxury in a world wallowing in atomic fallout. Westwood's Blade Runner is a faithful video game rendition of the movie, expertly recreating Scott's seductively grim, decaying version of 2019 Los Angeles. Set concurrent to the movie's events, you stroll through dystopian Los Angeles as rookie Blade Runner Ray McCoy, whose latest assignment proves to be one that can make or break his career. As pointed out in the game's manual, Blade Runner is a game of patience. Answers rarely show themselves, and you'll probably need multiple playthroughs in order to get a better understanding of what's happening around you. You run around Los Angeles picking up clues and speaking to witnesses and pedestrians, simultaneously piecing together multiple crimes and figuring out how they're all connected, if at all. Some clues you find will be stored in a pause menu database called the KIA, and other clues and game objectives will only be spoken of and not cataloged, meaning you'll need to either take mental notes or grab a pen and paper to jot some stuff down. Westwood doesn't give you a lot of clear direction. I found myself staring at the clues I'd collected without any idea of what to do next more than a few times. There is an occasional feeling of aimlessness, but it can also feel impressively organic. Running out of leads and chancing upon something new while scanning through old clues can be quite exciting, spurring a great sense of simulated, unpredictable detective work. The the farther you get, the more connected Los Angeles becomes, evolving into a quasi-open world that brings with it an element of unpredictability, and unpredictability Westwood takes pretty seriously. Knowing where to go and who to talk to takes some time during your initial playthrough, but that knowledge will make your following playthroughs substantially faster, and it is a game I'd recommend playing through multiple times. The story can be tough to follow, and a second playthrough will help in understanding some larger plot points, possibly leading you to sympathize with a character you didn't before. To keep things relatively fresh, the game not only includes 13 different endings, some of which are pretty tricky to get, but also randomizes various story aspects, like which characters you encounter are human and which are replicant. Before we move further, I would like to mention a certain plot point that Westwood dropped the ball on, an elephant in Westwood's otherwise fantastic room. One of the game's central characters is Lucy, a 14-year-old girl who may or may not be a replicant. At certain points in the game, it pretty strongly points toward McCoy developing a romantic relationship with Lucy, which is obviously terrible. It's really very strange. I'm not sure what Westwood was going for here, but whatever that is, it's not executed well. Moving on, when given the opportunity, you're able to give certain NPCs the Voight Kampf test, or VK for short. The VK is a personality test that determines whether someone is human or a replicant. It supposedly tests a subject's emotional response 
to personal questions, these questions ranging from benign to overtly graphic. In both Blade Runner and Electric Sheep, replicants are said to lack empathy, and once Blade Runners discover a hiding replicant, they're authorized to shoot and kill on sight. In Westwood's Blade Runner, you receive bonus money for killing a replicant. Money can't always solve your problems, but it can and will make your job a bit easier. Of course, you'll have to ask yourself how you feel about killing a replicant. Are they as bad as society's made them out to be? Do they actually lack empathy? It's a brilliant conundrum Westwood throws you into, not only mirroring the thematic and philosophical depths of the book and movie, but carving out a space on their own by making the test interactable. Mechanically speaking, it's hard to tell how the VK test actually works. The manual lays out the basics, but the finer details are harder to understand. This is probably a good time to point out that Westwood's Blade Runner isn't available for purchase through any popular online marketplace. Place. To play it, you'll need to find a place that hosts abandonware. The lack of an official retailer coupled with its age means bug fixes and smooth installation guides can be tough to come by. My first playthrough lasted about 10 hours, and once I got to where the ending should be, the game wouldn't end. I combed the internet looking for a fix, but had no luck. You can find the endings on YouTube, which is how I had to end my adventure, but other issues like figuring out how the Voight-Kampf test worked, I had to figure out for myself. Self. One detail concerning the VK test I didn't catch until I read the manual was that you can rig it to make human subjects test out as replicants, or vice versa, giving you a way to be a very corrupt cop or give a replicant a chance to escape. It only makes it better that Westwood nails Blade Runner's ambience. All the creepy, decrepit nooks of Los Angeles paired with neon signs, perpetual rain, and McCoy's somber narration combine into some great scenes that, even more than 20 years after release, I found immersive enough to stop and absorb. But past the absolutely stunning visuals and heavy atmosphere, Westwood not only recreates the movie's material world, but extends its thematically chilling undertones of a humanity that's become apathetic, while making further connections with Dick's original book. The Earth and Electric Sheep is one ruined by World War, from which Fallout made much of the planet uninhabitable. Whole cities were abandoned as immigration became necessary, and a strange phenomena called Kipple slowly overtook that which was abandoned. Those who didn't immigrate risked becoming contaminated and labeled as specials. Humans that, as Dick writes it, dropped out of history, he ceased, in effect, to be a part of mankind. It's never defined what constitutes a special, but Electric Sheep partly focuses on one in John Isidore, a recurring character whose disposition is pretty close to that of an innocent child, going so far as to help hide replicants from Deckard at one point. How the world came to be a dystopia in Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, by contrast, is left mostly unanswered. Certain things, like Kipple, are represented on screen, but never explicitly referenced. The character J.F. Sebastian, for instance, acts in talks in the same fashion that John Isidore does, it's clear Isidore was an inspiration behind his character. But while this degradation is an integral plot point in Electric Sheep, the movie doesn't even mention the concept of certain humans losing mental capacity, nor the fact that society consequently deems them lower than human. Scott largely allows the audience to infer for themselves how the world came to be the way it is, and what society and humanity is like. This is part of what makes Scott's Blade Runner so strange. Not only is it based on an already eccentric novel, but its peculiarity stands alone without much explanation. The first time you watch Blade Runner, you might think the characters don't act like humans would reasonably act in certain situations, but this is because many of the characters in Blade Runner aren't human at all. There are androids, complex machines made to look human, but who are growing and developing their own sensibilities, sensibilities completely foreign to what we'd consider human. Westwood's Blade Runner is no different here. It's strange, it's weird, and perhaps most interestingly, it exists as a cross-section between the book and movie, almost like a halfway point between their differences. While expertly recreating much of the film's world and ambience, Westwood incorporates concepts like Kipple, Specials, and Nuclear War into its dialogue and story. During his last election campaign, Governor Colvig promised a bold new plan of action to clean up the worst regions of the highly toxic debris that surrounds our city, the so-called Kipple. Just how much progress has been made since then? 
We spoke to the governor just before his weekly meeting with the city council. Our studies have shown that the Kipple's effect upon Los Angeles is minor. The radiation and toxic waste is contained in relatively small pockets, all miles distant from the city center. Nevertheless, cleaning things up out there is a worthwhile goal, especially with the thousands of specials living on the city fringes. For now, all I can say is that we're looking at several options and I'm sure everyone will be pleasantly surprised by our final proposal. About halfway through Electric Sheep, Deckard is arrested while hunting a replicant. To his surprise, he's arrested by a cop he doesn't know when taken to a police station he's never seen. This eventually leads to Deckard having an identity crisis. Confused as to whether the reality he remembers is real and if the one he's witnessing is fabricated. Likewise, near the end of Westwood's Blade Runner, McCoy, while interviewing someone suspected of being a replicant, gets arrested by a cop he doesn't know and later interrogated by police that have never heard of him. McCoy is also left with his own identity crisis openly wondering if he really knows who he is. You wake up one day and find it's all been a dream. Or you wake up and discover you've been asleep all the time and the nightmare is real. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know who I was. A cop dangling on the short end of the stick? Or a rep whose memory banks had run out? This identity crisis is an audit on the decisions you've made and will make later on in the story. If you're not even sure if you're a replicant, how could you condemn others for the same crime? Most of the endings seem to indicate that McCoy is a replicant no matter what decisions you make, though a few do leave it up to interpretation. Replicant or not, Westwood's decision to openly question McCoy's identity reflects both the book and movie, both of which end leaving readers and viewers wondering if Deckard is a replicant. Who and what Deckard is has been answered kind of in interviews in Blade Runner sequel Blade Runner 2049, but again, this was 1997, long before those things saw the light of day. As explained in both the movie and game, replicants only have four-year lifespans, a concept completely absent in the book. Increasing this lifespan serves as motivation for not only the replicants in the game, but also as the key motivation behind the replicants in the movie. They have a desire to live, and they return to Earth in order to find an extension to the limited lifespan. To get the happiest endings in the game, you'll need to find DNA information that provides the replicants with the tools to possibly extend their lifespan. With the information I'd gotten from Tyrell, and the bits and pieces from his design subcons, maybe, just maybe, we had enough to keep us alive for a while. If you don't find all the DNA, some endings are still happy, but there's a bit of a sadder tone. I hadn't gotten enough of the DNA information to save either of us, so we had a limited amount of time together. We couldn't go back to the city. No doubt our days there were number two. So I decided just to drive. What's interesting about this is, at the end of the movie, Roy Batty, replicant and main villain, asks the replicant's creator, Eldon Tyrell, if there is any way to extend the four-year limit. Tyrell says it isn't possible, though they've tried, and Batty kills him in response. This is contradicted by a few characters in the game, who say there is a way to fix replicant lifespans, and hint Tyrell might have known this, which puts the ending of the movie in a bit of a different light. If Tyrell knew replicants could survive longer, not only was he willing to die to keep his secret, but it makes Batty and the movie's other replicants much more sympathetic characters. All they wanted to do was live. The book and movie don't necessarily avoid discussing whether or not replicants have a right to life, but they don't focus on it either. It's an unspoken discussion. Westwood, on the other hand, makes that question a centerpiece of the game's narrative. There's even a subplot around a civilian activist group that works to have replicants freed from servitude. I got some more questions for you. A lot of people involved in your cause, Spencer? Yes, sir, we're growing fast. As more and more people realize that replicants have cognitive and emotional legitimacy, the Citizens Against Replicant Slavery will spearhead the movement towards... Save the pitch for someone who gives a shit. We're peaceful people, Detective. We live by a code that men like you could never understand. I want to emphasize how much of a shame it is that Westwood's Blade Runner isn't available for standard purchase. It's a title you can really tell was carefully put together, and it's not often a game based on a movie comes along that nails the atmosphere and spirit of the movie it's based on, let alone also adding elements from the book that inspired the movie. Soon after release, Electronic Arts acquired Westwood and moved the team from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. In an interview with YouTuber Ragnaroks, Blade Runner director Lewis Cass 
Castle says that if you were to recreate the game, you need the original source code. Unfortunately, much of the game's source code was lost in the studio's move to Los Angeles. It's sadly ironic, a game about androids searching for a way to live longer itself wasn't able to live long before becoming abandoned, and that's just too bad. Blade Runner was and is a masterful example of how to treat a license. It deserves to be played, it deserves to be enjoyed, and its memory shouldn't be lost like tears in rain.